there are five eyes and two nose. A striking scene in St. Louis County as COVID cases surge there. Celebration after the city council votes to rescind the mask mandate. Tonight, the county executive insists the mask mandate remains in effect despite the vote. That mask mandate just one of many returning nationwide in response to the Delta variant surge. In the House, anger tonight after Republicans refused to wear masks despite a new mandate and mounting questions about the possible need for COVID booster shots to help against the Delta variant. Pfizer provides data that says it shows a third shot would help tonight what the FDA and CDC say about their data. And a COVID cover up in Russia? Our report tonight on whether officials there don't want the world to know the reality on the ground, which could include many more COVID cases and deaths than reported. And breaking tonight, a deal struck on that bipartisan infrastructure compromise, but divisions are growing among Democrats about what comes next. And the important conversations about athletes' mental health sparked by Olympian Simone Biles' stunning decision to drop out of even more events at the Olympics. Tonight, a report on the lifeline granted to HBCU students and graduates, the debt forgiveness helping to give them a chance to thrive once they graduate. And I seen that my bill was zeroed. I got off of it, I logged back in, and I checked it again. <laughs> like, I kept checking it, like, like repeatedly, it because it just didn't make sense to me. And they are some of the world's most beautiful places, stunning snapshots of our planet's history and human ingenuity. Tonight, the brand new World Heritage Sites just announced, offering a roadmap for your next vacation. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. The great mask debates are back and seemingly here to stay for a while. At one point this summer, it appeared that we had perhaps moved beyond talking about mask mandate surges and shutdowns. And yet, once again, with the growing concerns about the spread of the Delta variant, we have renewed debate about mask mandates and now vaccine mandates. Dr. Anthony Fauci says that the Delta variant has changed the entire landscape. The U.S. is currently averaging nearly 57,000 new cases a day, up 400 percent in just five weeks. More than 32,000 people hospitalized with COVID a month ago. There were just 12,000. As a result, officials across the country are, are taking action, recommending or mandating masks indoors, even for those who are vaccinated. That new guidance is sparking some anger, but doctors tonight are urging people to listen to the science and not their politicians and above all else, get vaccinated. Late today, Facebook and Google announced that they will mandate employees in the U.S. be vaccinated before returning to work. And some cities are resorting to cold, hard cash to try and win over those who are hesitant. New York City announcing $100 to anyone who gets a vaccine at a city-run site. Trevor All pleads us off tonight. Tonight, the Delta variant tearing through much of the country, spreading furiously among the unvaccinated, with COVID cases soaring nearly 400% in the last five weeks. If you're not getting vaccinated, I feel like it's kind of unethical or can irresponsible at this point because it's so dangerous. President Biden expected to mandate vaccines or testing for nearly 2 million federal workers and today New York requiring the vaccine or weekly testing for all state workers with the original epicenter of the virus once again facing substantial spread averaging a thousand infections a day. New York City will now pay you to get vaccinated. $100 for any New Yorker who goes to a city-run site to get vaccinated. And adding to the urgency, new evidence fully vaccinated people with breakthrough infections can potentially spread the Delta variant, something that was highly unlikely with the earlier Alpha variant. When a person gets infected who has been vaccinated, namely a breakthrough infection, and they get infected with the Delta variant, that the level of virus in their nasopharynx is about a thousand times higher than with the alpha variant. The CDC pointing to unreleased data showing an infected vaccinated person carries the same viral load as an infected unvaccinated person. A major reason the agency's now recommending masks indoors for everyone in areas with high transmission. But in many of those hot zones, resistance. Seven states already have laws banning mask mandates. Arkansas's ban taking effect today. Most 
And overnight, St. Louis voting to end a local indoor mask mandate a day after it went into effect. But the county executive insisting it remained in effect and blamed the pushback on politics. On Capitol Hill, House Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy slamming a new mask rule in the House of Representatives, tweeting, the threat of bringing masks back is not a decision based on science. Asked about McCarthy's comments, Speaker Nancy Pelosi saying this. Is Kevin McCarthy a moron, and if so, why? Um, I, I said earlier in my comments, science, 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 and science. To say uh, that wearing a mask is not based on science, I think, is, is not wise, and that was my comment. And that's all I'm going to say about that. And tonight, Pfizer CEO pushing for a booster shot, pointing to new research showing the vaccine after six months goes from 96% effective to 84% effective against symptomatic COVID. And another new study showing a booster shot can boost antibodies fivefold in younger people. Pfizer could ask for emergency authorization for a booster within weeks. We can see that uh, there is a drop in uh, the protection of uh, infections, and there is a drop in the hospitalization protection against hospitalizations, but only for people, or mainly for people, that they are six months. Uh, uh, that they did six months ago their second dose. Today at Tampa General Hospital, we saw the toll on the unvaccinated and the teams caring for them. This is heartbreaking because all this could have been avoided. This is unnecessary human suffering. They're treating nearly seven times as many COVID patients as they were just weeks ago, nearly all of them unvaccinated. Gerard Considine was not vaccinated and got COVID. He was intubated for nine days. I'm not used to you and, you know, uh, being strong and stuff like that and not being afraid of stuff. But this scared the heck out of me. And 37-year-old Amanda Spencer from Ohio now wants the shot. She got COVID while on vacation in Florida, spending 11 days in a medically induced coma. The side effects are nothing compared to what can happen to you. I mean, it's very, very real. I mean, my pictures prove it. Yes, so many who have been at that brink now trying to make that appeal to Americans. And Trevor joins us now from Tampa. Hey, Trevor, when might the FDA give full approval to Pfizer's vaccine, a move that, that certainly could potentially convince more hesitant Americans to get a shot? Oh, definitely, Lindsay, and I've heard that from a lot of people who say they're holding out for full authorization. Sources tell us tonight that they're expecting that full FDA approval sometime around September, which is only three or four months after Pfizer's application. It's much faster than what is usually about a year-long process. The FDA is trying to speed up that time frame without cutting any corners because, of course, you have to try to convince those people who are skeptical of the process and aren't yet sold on the vaccine safety, even though the experts insist that it is, in fact, safe. And then also also, Lindsay, on that same timeline, Pfizer says they are hopeful that they can get emergency use authorization around September to start giving their shot to children as young as five years old. Right, Lindsay. Those five to 11 year old studies still going on right now. And Trevor, we saw you inside that ICU at the Tampa General Hospital. We noticed that, that you and many of the healthcare workers were in a lot less PPE than we would normally see in those circumstances. Mm -hmm. Is that because of changes this healthcare system has made to their COVID unit? It was, Lindsay. This was a bit of a different experience in ICUs, having been in a few of them. And the reasoning, according to uh, all of these healthcare workers that I was with today, is that they've determined the most dangerous time for someone who has worn PPE and who's been some, uh, around someone who is COVID positive is when they're taking off all of that gear. So instead, is they have extremely limited the number of times that they actually go into the room. We saw, and you saw in the video, they've moved a lot of those machines, like the dialysis machines, out of the rooms that the patients are staying in. That way, nurses and doctors Doctors can make adjustments to the machines without having to head in unnecessarily. They say that uh, this is a safer decision overall, but they do acknowledge that it does come with some detriments. Something that we hear about in a lot of COVID patients is that part of the struggle is that they have an intense feeling of isolation. When you are contagious, you can't have people around you. You can't have visitors. And now in this circumstance, you also have a limited um, uh, number of care providers who are actually in the room spending time with you. And we heard that from Gerard 
Bernard, one of those positive patients who thankfully is now recovering. He told me that when he was kind of in and out of consciousness before he was intubated, he had this feeling that he was locked in a room and that people would periodically open the door, peep their head in, ask if he was there, and then close it again. Now, they were providing more care than that, but that was the feeling that he had, and that's something that a lot of COVID patients are struggling with, particularly as we have seen those unvaccinated COVID patients, because the likelihood of the virus having a serious impact on your body is much more high. Lindsay. Right. And we can't imagine just how detrimental that isolation factor could be as well. Trevor Alt, our thanks to you. The battle over mask mandates once again playing out in local communities. We showed you that celebration in St. Louis County last night after the city council there voted to rescind a mask mandate in indoor public settings that had just been put back into place on Monday. But the St. Louis County executive insists today that that mandate still stands. And for more on this, we're joined now by Dr. Faisal Khan, the director of the St. Louis County Department of Public Health. Thanks so much for being here, doctor. Thank you. It's a pleasure, Lindsay. So first, just clarify for, us, clarify for us, is an indoor mask mandate still in effect for St. Louis County, Missouri? So, you know, that's a very good question, and that was my greatest fear um, based on what the council uh, chose to do last night, that it would create utter confusion in the minds of uh, individuals and businesses as to, where, as to whether a mask mandate was in force. Um, as things stand now, the legal status um, the precise legal status of the mask mandate will be determined by uh, legal recourse, I'm sure, at some point in the future. Um, our public health message based on that mask mandate still stands. We stand by the recommendations that we made in that mandate, which was to encourage people, regardless of vaccination status, to remain masked while in indoor settings. So I guess the question then is, is it enforceable at this point? Regrettably, no. And um, the reason for that is very simple. Um, the enforcement mechanism would have followed once the mandate was rolled out. Regrettably, the council's actions have made that um, almost impossible to follow through on. At this point in time, we are entirely dependent on the responsible corporate behavior um, of individual businesses and business settings and proprietors and owners and senior management to ensure that their staff and customers remain masked while they're indoors. But we have no mechanism to actually enforce it. You told the council that the data backs up the case for a renewed mask mandate due to rising hospitalizations and more younger COVID-19 patients. What are you seeing right now as far as the impact of the Delta variant in your particular area? Community transmission in the St. Louis region, as indeed uh, throughout Missouri, is at an all-time high. We are very worried about what uh, the late summer, early fall um, season will begin uh, bring for us. School goes back in session in a couple of weeks. And so we're working with school districts to ensure that kids and staff remain uh, masked while indoors and to encourage vaccination for 12 plus. Um, but the fact is that um, the St. Louis region is now dealing with the same sort of situation that we saw play out in southwest Missouri in Springfield, which made the um, uh, headlines a couple of weeks ago. And so our message, uh, what we're taking great pains to explain to people is you cannot run away from this. You cannot will away the virus. It does not discriminate between politicians of one creed versus another it will cause more misery, more infection, and more death. There is no doubt about that. Have you seen any uptick in vaccination rates at all as the cases and hospitalizations have risen in recent weeks, or are the hesitant still holding out on taking the vaccine? Unfortunately, progress has been very slow, and um, that is for a variety of reasons. Uh, vaccine hesitancy, doubts about uh, the efficacy of the vaccine, mistrust of government, et cetera, and on and on. However, um, the fear that um, escalated as a result of what was happening in southwest Missouri did create a little bit of a bump. However, 55 percent of the people in the St. Louis region are still not vaccinated, and that is a ripe population segment for uh, the Delta variant of the coronavirus to cause misery and disease. What do you say to those critics, though, who say that bringing back ma mask mandates, even for the vaccinated, really undermines confidence that the vaccines actually work if vaccinated people still have to wear a mask? First of all, the virus determines the future course of action. 
public health and uh, the scientific community base our recommendations on the best available evidence. What we know today um, it, uh, to be effective against the coronavirus is not the same as what we knew in November last year and is not the same as what we knew to be true in March this year. So our response evolves and is modified according to the situation that presents itself in front of us. The Delta variant was not around two, two, two and a half months ago. It is now the predominant variant across the United States. And so we have to be nimble in our response. And we've seen the debate over masks politicized, of course, and opponents saying that, that wearing one should be an individual choice. We saw one NFL player who came out today describing himself as pro-choice when it comes to vaccines. As a public health official, how do you respond to that personal choice or freedom argument? I am certainly um, respectful of deferring opinions. There's no doubt about that. However, the greater good and the collective good is more important than individual nuances of liberty and freedom at this point in time. As a nation of individualists, we are seeing the results of that play out across the country. More death and misery has been caused by attitudes at this point in time than anything else. That is really sad and should cause all of us to reflect on what we're doing. Vaccin va the vaccines available today are safe and effective. People need to listen to public health messages, get the vaccine, and continue to wear masks, because that is the situation we're confronted with. And by the way, this is not the only variant around. There will be more in the future, because that's what viruses do. They find susceptible hosts and communities, they thrive, they mutate, and they ge regenerate anew. And lastly, Doctor, if I can just kind of get a, a personal sense, I, I think I'm detecting a little bit of frustration in your voice when you're just trying to follow the science and, and other people are really pushing back on that so much and, and it puts other people's lives at stake. How are you feeling about all this? Look, I don't, as a public health professional, I really don't care what someone's political affiliations are, whether they're Democrat or Republican or Libertarian or what have you. This virus will not discriminate. This virus will not stop at state or city or county boundaries. It never has and it never will in the 18 months that we've been fighting it. So please get over yourselves, do the responsible common sense thing, get a shot, get over your ignorance. Don't listen to the nonsense being peddled on social media and WhatsApp. And please do not listen to politicians who try to mislead you by scoring cheap political points and indulge in populist opinion and fear-mongering over this. The science and the evidence behind this is very clear. This is a clear and present danger to the health and safety of people in the United States, including the St. Louis region. We are running out of time. We do not want any more people to die of the coronavirus than already have. Six and a half million, six, 160,000 at last count. Dr. Faisal Khan from the St. Louis County Department of Public Health, we thank you so much for joining us. Appreciate your time. Thank you so much, Lindsay. Next to a major headline out of Washington, D.C., late today, Senate negotiators finally reached a bipartisan deal on infrastructure with a key test vote that failed last week, passing with enough votes tonight to allow debate on the bill. So what's in the final deal and are enough Republicans as well as Democrats on board? ABC's congressional correspondent Rachel Scott has the very latest from Capitol Hill. Tonight, the president who campaigned on a promise to work with Republicans, declaring the new bipartisan infrastructure deal shows the world our democracy can function and deliver. While there's a lot we don't agree on, I believe that we should be able to work together on the few things we do agree on. I think it's important. The $1.1 trillion package negotiated by the White House and five senators from each party. The president working the phones to get it across the finish line. America needs to see us be able to tackle an important issue that will affect the lives of Americans. The plan includes $550 billion in new spending, $110 billion for highways, $65 billion to expand broadband internet, and $73 billion to modernize the electric grid. By one estimate, it would create roughly 500,000 new manufacturing jobs by 2024. If you're stuck in bridge traffic in my state or any other state right now, wondering why this bridge in poor condition can't get fixed, help is on its way.
Senators taking that key vote tonight on advancing the bill, but Democrats will need 10 Republicans to join them to pass it. Well, Senator Blatt, is this going to go through? Will you vote for it? Well, I'm, I'm checking two things um, in the bill right now. I've been an advocate for having a strong infrastructure package for a long time. So you're holding out. Not, that's not a yes. No, it's not. Not quite a yes just yet. Rachel Scott joins us now live from the Capitol. And Rachel, we have certainly been talking about this for weeks, if not months, but it looks like finally uh, they have a deal. Still a long road ahead, though, it, it seems. Explain what happens next. Yeah, this still has a little bit of a ways to go, Lindsay, but it is a rare moment of bipartisanship that doesn't really happen here on Capitol Hill. A positive sign tonight, 17 Republicans voting with every single Democrat to advance this bill. That includes Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell. But still, you will have some senators in the coming days that may try to force some changes to the text and to this bill. Uh, Senate Majority Leader uh, Chuck Schumer saying tonight that they may be here for long weekends very long nights and then of course it will have to go over to the house where democrats hold a razor thin majority and they will have to get every single member of their caucus on board to get that through too lindsay and it also sounds like some progressives in the house are already saying that they may not be on board unless they also get their separate spending priorities considered Right, exactly. We heard from the Progressive Caucus as this deal was reached. They said that they will not vote for this bipartisan package unless there is a promise and a plan to pass a much larger deal that Democrats plan to push through on their own. That package, $3.5 trillion. For some moderates, though, that number is just too high. So again, still a lot of work to do, and Democrats will have to get on the same page first, Lindsay. Still more work ahead. <laughs> Rachel Scott reporting in live for us from the Capitol once again. Thanks so much, Rachel. Thanks. Now to the dozens of fires in the West forcing authorities to issue new air quality alerts in six states. The alerts all the way east to Boston this week and we're still weeks away from peak fire season. Will Carr reports in from California tonight. Tonight, the governors of California and Nevada getting a first-hand look at the aftermath of the Tamarack fire, that fire straddling both states. The governors thanking firefighters and pleading for more resources. Cal Fire is the largest civilian aerial attack force in the world, and it's not enough. The choking smoke from massive wildfires across the West, forcing authorities to issue air quality alerts in Washington, Idaho, Montana, Wyoming, Colorado, and Arizona. But even smaller blazes like this brush fire in San Jose overnight causing big problems. There is a lot of smoke from this fire and that's why they're asking homeowners to stay inside and keep their doors and windows shut. The towering columns of smoke from the explosive fire is reaching all the way into the jet stream this week, which as these satellite images show carries the smoke all the way to the east coast. Covering New England in hazy skies, Boston issuing warnings this week about air quality because of the smoke. Lindsay, back here in the West, these fires are being fueled by relentless heat waves. We're talking record setting heat and here in California today, they've issued another flex alert. Worry that temperatures up to 110 degrees could threaten the power grid. Lindsay. Well, certainly a lot of concern in the West. Now to Tokyo and Team USA, where for the second day, star gymnast Simone Biles has withdrawn from competition, citing her mental health. Biles deciding not to compete in the all-around competition where she was the favorite. ABC's James Longman has the very latest from Tokyo. Tonight, another shock from the greatest gymnast of our time. USA Gymnastics revealing that Simone Biles will not be competing in the all-around, her most anticipated event, saying she's doing so in order to focus on her mental health. Yesterday, after dropping out of the team finals, Biles told the media the stress of these unusual Olympics has been too much. It's been really stressful, this Olympic Games, I think, just as a whole, um, not having an audience. There are a lot of different variables going into it. The world was waiting to witness her death-defying routines, breaking records on the way to earning six goals at these games. But Biles scoring perhaps even bigger firsts, opening up conversations about athletes and mental health. Former teammate Ali Reisman speaking to ESPN. It's the most pressure I've ever seen on um, a gymnast and maybe even um, Olympic athlete and... I can't imagine how hard it is for her. Today, Biles seemed upbeat, cheering on the men in their all-around final. She may compete Sunday for a chance to spring back onto the vault. And back in the pool, a tough loss in the 200-meter freestyle for Katie Ledecky, finishing fifth. 
But just over an hour later, the swimming legend bouncing back, claiming her first gold medal of these games as she cruised to victory in the 1500 meter free, winning by more than four seconds. The 1500 meter freestyle has been an event since the 1904 Olympics in St. Louis, but only for men. This year, the first time ever women could compete. Ledecky saying her grandparents gave her strength as she cemented her place in history. I'm always striving to be my best and to be better than I've ever been. And, um, you know, it's not easy when your times are world records in some events. Adding that she understands the intense pressure felt by Simone Biles. Mental health is so important. Physical health is so important. And uh, it's no different being Olympians. And right, that mental health aspect just cannot be understated. James Longman joins us now once again from Tokyo. So much focus on the physical feats, but, but these athletes are making it clear that the mental aspect is also a big part of their performance. Absolutely, Lindsay. You know, a lot of theories swirling around as to why Simone Biles backed out of these two competitions. It's possible that there are no fans in the stands. It's the first time her family hasn't been able to watch her. her. Age might be a contributing factor. I mean, 24 is not old, but by gymnastic standards, it's older at least. Uh, but her teammates and her friends have been uh, rallying around her, saying they support her privacy. Uh, Ali Reisman, who you remember, uh, competed alongside her in Rio at the last Olympics, saying that it's just, it's impossible really for anyone to understand the sheer amount of pressure that is on Simone Biles. She is the face, essentially, of Team USA. Any product that you see being sold here at the Olympics, any commercial on TV, it's often got her face on it. So it's just difficult for anybody, really, to understand it. Katie Ledecky, as well, is winning in the pool here in Tokyo, saying the same thing. Uh, when you're watching her and you're watching the, the athletes in the, the hall here at the Ariaki Stadium, you can see the press pack move around the entire floor following her. They don't look at anyone else. They, a, a couple of the cameramen stay behind. But fundamentally, every single piece of apparatus she's on, there's an enormous press pack following her around. And that is the amount of pressure that she's under. So I just think it's, uh, it's just something that none of us can really comprehend. And the fear, the fear, has, for that to have come back into her mind now when she's performing some of these tricks, which could kill her, I think it's important to emphasize, to, to get that out of your system can take weeks. But she hasn't got weeks. She's got days. And so that's, I think, why she's taking it one step at a time. Lindsay? And of course, before all of this, she had talked about that weight of the world pressure that she was feeling on her shoulder. James Longman in Tokyo for us. Thanks so much. Thanks, Lindsay. And when we come back, take a look at this salmon filled in the Columbia River. What scientists say caused this. The major consumer alert McCormick recalls three popular seasonings for possible salmonella contamination. What you need to know. But up next, some critics call it a cover up. Russia, another nation that produces its own COVID vaccine, may also be producing vaccine mistrust and it's having deadly consequences. Stay with us. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any place else. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast. Now streaming on ABC News Live. Admit it, these days what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. Robin Roberts, George Stephanopoulos, Michael Strahan. Wake up with America's number one most watched morning show, ABC's Good Morning America. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. ABC News, honored. Winner for the second straight year with the Edward R. Murrow Award for overall excellence in television. ABC News, America's number one news source. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. 
This is what being live is Three, all about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded by people. Squeezing, squeezing into this bomb shelter. We're on an urgent delivery run. With Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Good job. <laughs> Streaming straight to you anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. Now, when it matters most, the straightforward facts. ABC News is America's number one news. Good Morning America, number one in the morning, nine years running. World News Tonight with David Muir, number one in the evening with America's most watched newscast. 2020, the number one news magazine on Friday nights. The View, the number one daytime talk show. And ABC News Live, number one in streaming news. ABC News is America's number one news. McCormick is recalling three popular seasonings for possible salmonella contamination. The seasonings include Frank's Red Hot Buffalo Ranch seasoning and its perfect pinch and culinary Italian seasoning offerings. The products are sold by major stores in 32 states from Florida to Maine, the Midwest, Texas, and also California. No illnesses have been reported to date in connection with these recalled products. And last night, we brought you a report about the COVID crisis in Indonesia, a nation where a lack of vaccines is fueling the deadly and relentless pandemic. But tonight, we travel to Russia, a nation where they have created a vaccine that many experts say appears to be effective, yet that nation is enduring a devastating third wave and critics accuse officials there of a cover-up. Patrick Revolt files this in-depth report. This was a holiday Russian authorities decided had to happen. Navy Day in St. Petersburg. The government pressing ahead with this grandiose naval parade despite the country being pummeled by a third wave of coronavirus. <laughs> <laughs> Only at the last minute did city authorities ask people not to attend, but thousands still came out, packed together, most without masks. There are a few small inconveniences, unpleasantness, but they are all smoothed out by the mood, by the wonderful holiday. Everything is okay. Everything's fine. The mixed messaging over the parade sums up Russia's approach to COVID. From mid-June, hospitals have been swamped and deaths have surged. Russia's vaccine, Sputnik V, was the first registered for COVID-19. But at 47 percent, the country has one of the highest levels of vaccine skepticism in the world. We don't trust the vaccines because to trust vaccines, you need a lot of time. And this is just like an experiment on people. That low rate of vaccination has been coupled with few pandemic restrictions, leaving Russia largely defenseless. Officially, mass events, over 75 people, are banned in St. Petersburg right now. But frankly, walking around, you would never know that there were any restrictions. It's definitely like a different world. Um, you know, you come in from a place that's really strict on restrictions and mask wearing and PP and all that stuff, especially in public transport. Um, and then you come to a place where nobody follows any guidelines. Russian officials claim the country can celebrate its pandemic response, boasting it's come through better than most, reporting a death toll of around 150,000. But publicly available data suggests that doesn't add up. Around the world, experts have adopted a common method for best assessing the pandemic's true toll by counting what's called excess deaths. That is, comparing the total number of deaths in a country during the pandemic to the total deaths in an average year. During the pandemic, almost every country has seen a steep increase in total deaths. And despite the official toll, Russian national statistics show it isn't an exception. Russia's government has argued it applies a more conservative approach to calculating COVID deaths, but that doesn't explain such a large difference. Last 15 years, the mortality steadily went down, 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 down and down. But uh, in November and December of last year, the number of deaths have been uh, rec uh, record, have been the biggest in, in history, in post-war history in Russia. Alexei Raksha was fired from Russia's National Statistics Agency after he publicly pointed out how the country's official toll was undercounting. 
Russian national statistics show that since the start of the pandemic, Russia has suffered at least 470,000 more deaths than normal. And that doesn't yet include June and July. I think that by the end of September, the overall excess mortality will be at least 700,000 people. So it's a huge number and no any European country sits uh, above Russia in this table. That would be around half a million more than Russia's official death toll. Critics say this is a dangerous cover-up and is fueling the third wave currently ravaging Russia. They don't care about the life and health of people because the main thing is to do something, to show a picture. They need to create the impression that everything is okay. In St. Petersburg, Alexander Yablokov is in no doubt that the official numbers are an undercount. In the COVID ward he was in, all but one of seven people with him died within a week. It seemed to me that I had found myself in a morgue, not a hospital, but a morgue. Experts say the third wave appears to finally be easing in Moscow and St. Petersburg, but the process is slow. And with much of Russia still reluctant to get vaccinated and few restrictions to curb the virus, the fear is there will be many more deaths to hide. Patrick Rival, ABC News, Moscow. Our thanks to Patrick for that. Still ahead here on Prime, our weather team is tracking severe storms moving across the country. Right now, the Midwest is in the crosshairs. The Northeast on alert. The longest running children's animated series is coming to an end. And what are the new places on the planet that we should treasure? We take a look by the numbers. But first, our post of the day, Kanye West showing off this empty, perhaps dreary looking room is actually inside the basement of a stadium where he's currently staying while working on a new album. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? I hug you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. This is what being live is all about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded by people no squeezing into this bomb shelter. We're on urgent delivery run. With Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Lift off. Streaming straight to you anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. Assault on the Capitol, the ABC News original, exclusively on Hulu, now streaming. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any place else. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast, now streaming on ABC News Live. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. Robin Roberts, George Stephanopoulos, Michael Strahan. Wake up with America's number one most watched morning show, ABC's Good Morning America. ABC News, honored. Winner for the second straight year with the Edward R. Murrow Award for overall excellence in television. ABC News, America's number one news source. 
Welcome back, everyone. They are some of the world's most beautiful places. They can be wonders built millennia ago, stunning natural phenomenons, or places of immense cultural significance. Tonight, the United Nations Education, Scientific, and Cultural Organization, known as UNESCO, has named its newest World Heritage Sites. We take a look by the numbers. UNESCO has been naming World Heritage Sites since 1978, and to date have named 1,153 total locations to its coveted World Heritage list. To join the list, places must be of outstanding universal value and meet at least one of ten criteria, including a masterpiece of human creative genius or exceptional natural beauty. Getting named a World Heritage Site can lead to a massive boost in tourists. You're looking at some of those beautiful places right behind me. The last of this year's selections were just announced today. In total, UNESCO named 33 new World Heritage Sites, including a 2,300-year-old solar observatory in Peru, dubbed a masterpiece of human creative genius. Other selections include an ancient Chinese city dating back to the 10th century known as the Emporium of the World, and Madrid's famous Retiro Park. The beautiful area in Spain's capital city has been used recreationally since at least the 15th century. No sites from the U.S. were added this year, but the U.S. is home to 24 World Heritage Sites, including Yellowstone National Park and Philadelphia's Independence Hall. And we still have lots to get to here on Prime tonight, the shark sightings that have shut down several popular beaches will tell you where. And the lifeline tonight for more HBCU students and graduates, student loan debt forgiveness. Is this a trend that could spread elsewhere? But first, look at our top trending stories on abcnews.com. News Now. And America This Morning. The best new video. The breaking news overnight. Emergency crews called to the town of Surfside. U.S. airstrikes hitting targets in Iraq and Syria. The stories people are talking about. If you don't want to shave your legs, don't. I was going to say, oh my God. And what to expect in the day ahead. ABC World News Now and America This Morning. Starting at 2 a.m. Eastern. Up all night to keep you up to date. Now, when it matters most, the straightforward facts. ABC News is America's number one news. Good Morning America, number one in the morning, nine years running. World News Tonight with David Muir, number one in the evening with America's most watched newscast. 2020, the number one news magazine on Friday nights. The View, the number one daytime talk show. And ABC News Live, number one in streaming news. ABC News is America's number one news. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. ABC News, honored. Winner for the second straight year with the Edward R. Murrow Award for overall excellence in television. ABC News, America's number one news source. This is GMA3, what you need to know. GMA3. A third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon. It's all about you. Lunchtime on ABC. This is what being live is Three all seconds. about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded this by people no squeezing into this bomb shelter. We're on an urgent delivery run. With Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Let's go. Streaming straight to you anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real-life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. Most powerful stories of our time, anytime. Nightline.
Americans masked up once again with the CDC now recommending everyone wear face coverings indoors regardless of vaccination status in areas hit hard by COVID. The CDC saying masks should also be on in schools with recent data showing even some vaccinated people can spread the highly contagious Delta variant. Those people could potentially pass it on to somebody, a loved one who is immunosuppressed. It really concerns me. Um, I've had the vaccine, but even with having the vaccine, uh, I'm still trying to be cautious. President Biden considering requiring all federal employees to get their shots. If not, they'd have to mask up and get tested regularly. The nation's largest university system, California State University, mandating all of its nearly 500,000 students to get their shots this fall. It provides just another blanket of security because the vaccine isn't perfect, but it's probably the best thing we can do. We still have the heat, and now we're tracking severe storms moving across the country. Parts of the Midwest, including much of Wisconsin, bracing for powerful thunderstorms, large hail, and dangerous straight-line winds. The system bringing with it possible tornadoes moving into the Northeast tomorrow, affecting D.C. to Philly to New York. Then there's the heat wave, now across 20 states. The heat index in triple digits from Nebraska all the way to Alabama. New details about the mass shooting at an Indiana FedEx facility last April. When Brandon Hall opened fire at the FedEx plant in Indianapolis, it took three minutes for him to indiscriminately kill eight people. In this specific incident, that's something that only the shooter honestly knows. The FBI found no bias, no ideological motive. So why, Chief Randall Taylor said, remains unknown. Burdened with mental health issues and daily suicidal thoughts, Taylor died in what the FBI called an act of suicidal murder. He believed would demonstrate his masculinity and capability while fulfilling a final desire to experience killing people. The heat isn't just getting to us humans, but fish too. Water temperatures so high, these salmon are literally being cooked to death. This video from July captures the heat stressed sockeye in Washington's Little White Salmon River at the Columbia River Gorge. Water temperatures reportedly exceeded 70 degrees. The red lesions and white fungus, a sign of stress for the salmon as they try to swim upstream to spawn. One expert likening it to running a marathon in 100 degrees reheat. A wonderful kind of day for Arthur, but a sad day for us. After 25 years, the hit children's show on PBS is coming to an end. Arthur was the longest running animated series in history. An eight-year-old aardvark teaching us all kindness, even portraying a gay wedding. In recent years, Arthur reached meme status with images like these. The last new episode airs early 2022. Welcome back now to a scare in the town of Hempstead on New York's Long Island, which closed several beaches today after the latest in a series of shark sightings in the area and one day after a lifeguard was potentially bitten by a shark nearby. Here's ABC's Ariel Reshef. Tonight, several beaches off Long Island, New York, closed due to shark sightings. Early today, around 1 o'clock in the afternoon, uh, our guard spotted numerous, not just a singular, but numerous uh, black tip reef sharks. Hempstead lifeguards spotting one of those sharks just 20 yards from the shoreline. Our lifeguards were able to identify two fins um, that were a shark and also another shark that breached out of the water, which was much more clearly identifiable. Experts say this type of shark can reach up to six feet in size, but is not typically aggressive towards humans. These are actually more of a Caribbean shark, uh, and we don't know the last time we've seen a sighting up here of this of this sort of shark. There is some speculation it could be based on uh, the hurricane season kicking up and the waters pushing up. The group of sharks also noticed at two other nearby beaches, forcing them to close temporarily. This coming as authorities investigate a possible shark bite at Jones Beach earlier this week. A lifeguard saying before the incident, he saw a fin. Officials have stepped up boat patrols and jet ski patrols in the area. They also have lifeguards walking up and down the shoreline. They say that shark attacks are rare, but these closures are precaution to keep beachgoers safe. Lindsay. Ariel, thank you. And now to the unfriendly skies, where according to the FAA, the issue of passengers behaving badly on airplanes is not getting any better. As ABC's Alex Stone reports, most of the incidents are apparently sparked by COVID restrictions. 
It's an increasing problem for flight attendants, passengers ignoring in-flight rules and becoming violent. Like this case in May, a female passenger on a Southwest Airlines flight landed in San Diego and authorities say she knocked out a flight attendant's tooth. Why do you have a right to put your hands on me though? Or this woman on a Delta flight this month when she was asked to wear a mask. As soon as they deplane, you're going to jail. Once a plane landed, police moved in. You're not respecting my human rights. New numbers in from the FAA show just in the past week it has received 106 reports of unruly passengers on board planes. Since January, the FAA has received 3,615 such reports. Of those, 2,666 have involved passengers refusing to wear a mask. This is way higher than any number of incidents that we've ever seen in any other year. This cell phone video shows two men fighting as they got off of a Frontier Airlines flight in Miami this month. The FAA is enforcing its zero-tolerance policy. Fines being assessed for fighting with a flight attendant can be as high as $52,000 and can come with 20 years in prison. While masks remain for now, airline executives have been optimistic the mask mandate might not be renewed when it expires in September. But with rising COVID cases in the U.S., ditching the masks on board is seeming less likely this week, meaning policing masks could continue to be a job for flight crews. Flight attendants have a lot of work to do every single day on every single flight. And it's not only a problem in the air. The TSA says it, too, is dealing with a rise in assaults on its officers, officers being pushed or even bitten at airport security checkpoints. Our thanks to Alex for that. And now to a new trend in higher education. A number of universities, including more than 10 historically black colleges and universities, are paying off students outstanding bills. Today, the City University of New York, known as CUNY schools, announced debt forgiveness for more than 50,000 students impacted by the pandemic. The famed Spelman and Clark Colleges in Atlanta also pledging to wipe out students' debts. These moves are reigniting the larger debate about student loan forgiveness in our nation's capital. White House correspondent Mary Alice Parts has this report. Um, yes, so I so ran you were busy. that. Yes. Back on campus at her alma mater, Alinda Williams tells me at first she did not believe what she was seeing. I looked and my bill was zeroed out. Just zero, you just had zero. It said zero, like I owe nothing. The first in her family to graduate from college, Williams worked each semester on campus, sometimes two jobs at a time. But the bills piled up until last May, right before graduation, when Delaware State University decided to wipe hers clean. What has it meant for you and your family and your mom? It means a lot. It was definitely a weight lifted off her shoulder. One less thing that she had to stress about. You were telling me that you're not sure how you were going to pay that off, the two of you. I was not sure. My mother was not sure. University President Tony Allen has known and worked closely with President Biden for more than two decades. He says it was the money provided to schools through the recent COVID relief legislation that allowed him to cancel more than 700,000 in unpaid bills in May. We wanted to make sure that no senior walked away from here with any debt. Our students come to the university for a quality education, first and foremost, but they're also trying to change the economic trajectory for themselves, their families, and their communities. So you can imagine when COVID hit, uh, there was a big concern that that was not going to happen for a lot of them. Delaware State University, one of many historically black colleges and universities around the country, clearing account balances for returning and graduating students. It doesn't surprise me at all uh, that my colleagues have followed suit. Uh, it is the HBCU philosophy, and when you think about the number of first-generation college students that come to an HBCU, the number of low-resource students that come to an HBCU, this is mission-driven what we are doing. These are the things that we are supposed to do. The issue of student loan debt has been front and center this last year during the pandemic. It's estimated that American borrowers owe around $1.7 and student loan debt. The federal government paused payments, but that extension is about to expire, and bills are expected to come due again in September. Watch you this small. Woo! Like so many, Dr. Regita Small has struggled with debt well into her career. At 38, she works as an HR executive, but is still paying down her loans. She's also helping her mom and grandmother. There's a lot of other financial responsibilities that I have that don't necessarily allow me to do things like 
save or build wealth. When I think about family planning, if you will, you want to be able to afford to have children. And me personally, you know, I've had to put off that journey because I have this debt. I have these other financial responsibilities. While the majority of borrowers took out loans for two or four year schools, Dr. Small says that she needed a PhD to get ahead. Black women, after all, are often paid much less than white men. I have to get my master's and PhD to compete with that individual, whether, you know, similar school, similar, you know, levels of experience, um, but they, they may also have more wealth than I do. So I have to take off the loans. In one of their only public disagreements, Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer yesterday again pushed President Biden to extend the pause on federal student loan payments and cancel up to $50,000 per student in public loans. This pause has actually shown how important canceling student debt is to borrowers and to our economy. We've heard about being, how, how being saddled with this debt has affected millions of Americans' lives on so many choices that they'd like to make. But the ranking Republican member on the House Education Committee disagrees. It's clear that Senator Schumer cares nothing at all for the taxpayers of this country because it is hardworking taxpayers who provided the funds for these students to go to college. And by the way, 70 percent of taxpayers do not have baccalaureate degrees. So where are they in this equation? The Biden administration has moved to cancel debt for some students, including some with disabilities and others who were defrauded by a handful of for-profit colleges. But there's a debate in Washington over the limits of his authority. And the president himself so far has rejected proposals for blanket loan forgiveness. Back in February, this exchange. We need at least a $50,000 minimum. What will you do to make that happen? I will not make that happen. It depends on whether or not you go to a private university or a public university. Biden has this past year often talked about the wealth gap that in America often falls along racial lines. Activist Shakia Cherry Donaldson says she hopes the president will consider this issue of student loan debt as essential in the fight for racial equality. You can't try to plug one racial systematic hole without acknowledging that there are several more. And I think that this is one of the lowest hanging fruits that the administration could carry out that would drastically change people of color and particularly black women's lives. Every dollar spent on the computer, on the twin extra long sheets, on tuition, on dorm fees, on the meal plan, it was an investment. And not just me, but my entire bloodline, because I would be opening up new paths and new opportunities for the people that come behind me. Women in particular are estimated to hold nearly two-thirds of all outstanding loans. The American Association of University Women wrote about the problem, saying that while the amount of debt women initially take on compared to men is not huge, when women graduate, their debt repayment collides with the gender wage gap and the racial wealth gap to make it harder for them to repay their loans. Back in Delaware, President Allen says he's not talked to President Biden about this debate and respects the work the president has done on higher education. I know you said you're not in the business of giving him advice. I respect that. <laughs> but do you have a message for him on this issue? He understands uh, what students like mine go through. And I think he understands that deep in his bones. Remember where you come from and who you've been in the business of serving uh, for so many years um, across this country and make the decision from there. Trust your gut. Mary Alice Parks, ABC News, Washington. Such a timely and relevant piece. Our thanks to Mary Alice for that. Before we go tonight, our image of the day. We've all had something like this happen to us before, maybe not in front of royalty, but today in the UK, prime uh, British Prime Minister Boris Johnson couldn't seem to get his umbrella to work. He was intending a memorial service for fallen police officers, and the wind was just working against him. At one point, Prince Charles even laughed at his expense, as did many, as you can imagine, online. That is our show for this hour. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thanks so much for streaming with us. And coming up in the next hour, staying on top of several things, including why Shakira will soon be heading to trial for some charges that could land her behind bars if convicted. 
And in the last hour, you saw how several HBCUs are tackling student loan debt. We're going to broaden out that conversation. How did the student loan crisis in America get to be so bad, and what can be done to fix it? Stay with us. Now, when it matters most, the straightforward facts. ABC News is America's number one news. Good Morning America, number one in the morning, nine years running. World News Tonight with David Muir, number one in the evening with America's most watched newscast. 2020, the number one news magazine on Friday nights. The View, the number one daytime talk show. And ABC News Live, number one in streaming news. ABC News is America's number one news. Most powerful stories of our time, anytime. Nightline. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. I know what happened, and I'm not guilty. Why the fascination with criminal trials? Figure out what's really out there. She revealed she had murdered his family. I know in my heart they did this. It's the time of suspicion. The ending's really tough. You don't know whether truth is going to be difficult to find unless you try to find it. This is what being live is all about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded by no people squeezing into this bomb room. shelter. We're on an urgent delivery run. With Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Lift off. Streaming straight to you, anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. Hi, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. We're monitoring several developments here at ABC News at this hour. More than 80 wildfires are burning in the West tonight, and officials are issuing air quality alerts in at least six states, stretching from Washington to Arizona. The choking smoke forcing residents to stay inside their homes. This after haze was seen all the way to the Northeast this week with air quality alerts as far as New York and Boston. Actor Bob Odenkirk is in stable condition tonight after experiencing a heart related incident. The 58 year old collapsed on set while filming the sixth and final season of Better Call Saul. His family released a statement saying that they would like to express gratitude for the incredible doctors and nurses looking after him and thank everyone for the outpouring of well wishes. Simone Biles has withdrawn from another Olympic competition today. The star gymnast says she needed a break to work on her mental health. Her teammates and the world are rallying behind her. This as American swimmer Katie Ledecky won the gold for Team USA in the 1500 meter freestyle, winning by more than four seconds. Now to the growing concerns about the Delta variant tonight as cases surge, officials across the country are reinstating mask mandates and sparking debates that many thought were in the rearview mirror. The messages from doctors unambiguously clear tonight, get vaccinated. Trevor Alt reports. Tonight, the Delta variant tearing through much of the country, spreading furiously among the unvaccinated, with COVID cases soaring nearly 400% in the last five weeks. If you're not getting vaccinated, I feel like it's kind of unethical or con irresponsible at this point because it's so dangerous. President Biden expected to mandate vaccines or testing for nearly 2 million federal workers and today New York requiring the vaccine or weekly testing for all state workers with the original epicenter of the virus once again facing substantial spread averaging a thousand infections a day. New York City will now pay you to get vaccinated. $100 for any New Yorker who goes to a city run site to get vaccinated. And adding to the urgency, new evidence fully vaccinated people with breakthrough infections can potentially spread the Delta variant, something that was highly unlikely with the earlier Alpha variant. When a person gets infected who has been vaccinated, namely a breakthrough infection, and they get infected with the Delta variant, that the level of virus in their nasopharynx is about a thousand times higher than with the Alpha variant. 
The CDC pointing to unreleased data showing an infected vaccinated person carries the same viral load as an infected unvaccinated person. A major reason the agency's now recommending masks indoors for everyone in areas with high transmission. But in many of those hot zones, resistance. Seven states already have laws banning mask mandates. Arkansas's ban taking effect today. <laughs> And overnight, St. Louis voting to end a local indoor mask mandate a day after it went into effect. But the county executive insisting it remained in effect and blamed the pushback on politics. On Capitol Hill, House Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy slamming a new mask rule in the House of Representatives, tweeting, the threat of bringing masks back is not a decision based on science. Asked about McCarthy's comments, Speaker Nancy Pelosi saying this. Is Kevin McCarthy a moron, and if so, why? Um, I, I said earlier in my comment, science, 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 and science. To say uh, that uh, wearing a mask is not based on science, I think, is, is not wise. And that was my comment. And that's all I'm going to say about that. And tonight, Pfizer CEO pushing for a booster shot, pointing to new research showing the vaccine after six months goes from 96% effective to 84% effective against symptomatic COVID. And another new study showing a booster shot can boost antibodies fivefold in younger people. Pfizer could ask for emergency authorization for a booster within weeks. We can see that um, there is a drop in uh, the protection of uh, infections, and there is a drop in the hospitalization protection against hospitalizations, but only for people, or mainly for people, that they are six months. Uh, uh, that they did six months ago their second dose. Today at Tampa General Hospital, we saw the toll on the unvaccinated and the teams caring for them. This is heartbreaking because all this could have been avoided. This is unnecessary human suffering. They're treating nearly seven times as many COVID patients as they were just weeks ago, nearly all of them unvaccinated. Gerard Considine was not vaccinated and got COVID. He was intubated for nine days. I'm not used to you, you know, uh, being strong and stuff like that and not being afraid of stuff. But this scared the heck out of me. And 37-year-old Amanda Spencer from Ohio now wants the shot. She got COVID while on vacation in Florida, spending 11 days in a medically induced coma. The side effects are nothing compared to what can happen to you. I mean, it's very, very real. I mean, my pictures prove it. So many pleas like that. Our thanks to Trevor for that. And to Washington now and that breakthrough on a bipartisan infrastructure deal. After weeks of negotiating and stall talks, senators today move forward on with enough votes to debate the bill. The announcement comes as President Biden is revising a plan he hopes will create more American jobs. ABC's Alex Perche has the latest. On Capitol Hill, a bipartisan breakthrough. GOP Senate negotiators say they've reached an agreement on key aspects of a nearly $1 trillion infrastructure bill. We have good news. There's a bipartisan infrastructure bill that begins to address the needs of the American people. Details about the agreement are still emerging, but an aide close to the talks tells ABC News the amount of new spending in the package has decreased from $579 billion to $550 billion, spending that will repair roads, bridges, and tunnels, but also create jobs. Tonight, I'm intending to call a vote to move to proceed to the bipartisan infrastructure bill. I believe we have the votes for that. But passing it could be another challenge. The top Democrat in the House right now is noncommittal. We are rooting for it. We're hoping for the best, but I, I can't commit to passing something that I don't even know what it is yet. All this playing out as President Biden hits the road in Pennsylvania announcing proposed changes to the Buy American Act, he says will also boost jobs. In recent years, Buy America has become a hollow promise. But my, makes, my administration is going to make Buy American a reality. Those changes include increasing the percent of a product that would need to be made in the USA to qualify for purchase by the federal government. Contractors don't have to tell us the total domestic content of their products. They just have to tell us that they hit the threshold. Nobody checking. Well, they got a new sheriff in town. We're going to be checking. Lindsay, White House officials insist the changes won't impact partners, particularly Canada, who's been wary of the Buy American plan. Lindsay? Alex, thank you. 
And our Mary Alice Parks reported earlier tonight on colleges that have canceled student debt and the positive difference that that can make. Now we look at the other end of the spectrum, the nearly $2 trillion student loan crisis, and bring in Wall Street Journal reporter Josh Mitchell. His new book is called The Debt Trap, How Student Loans Became a National Catastrophe, and it comes out on August 3rd. Thanks so much for joining us tonight, Josh. Sure. Yes. Thanks. I want to start with someone that you profile in your book, former Sally Mae CEO Al Lord, who went from profiting off the skyrocketing cost of college to later claiming that he was shocked when it was time to pay for his own grandchildren's education. Tell us about that. Yeah, you know, Congress tried to expand access to higher education and give everyone uh, a chance to go to college. And so they started providing student loans and student loans did give access to college, but what it also did was it became a profit center for banks, for people like Al Lord, and for schools. And so on the one hand, a lot of students have been able to go to the college of their source, uh, choice because of student loans. They also took out a lot of debt that they now can't repay, and a lot of people made money off of that. And that also leads us to a larger point that you make in your book, that it's now often parents and grandparents who are taking on the student debt. Yes, I think that that's, that's the new shift right now. Um, uh, half of people with student debt are over 35. One in five are over age 50. Um, and so that, that share is only going to grow because right now what's happening is college students are hitting the limit on how much they could borrow and parents are having to pick up the slack. And so what we're seeing right now is it used to be where parents would actually pass wealth down to their children, but now what's happening is parents are taking on debt. And I think a lot of them are going to live with that debt for the rest of their life. And so this is something that we talk about, that we ask about, that we get upset about, you know, for a long time. The idea that college has gotten so expensive. Can this price just continue to keep rising year after year? Well, yes. Uh, people have been saying for a very long time, since 1980s, that you know, colleges couldn't continue to raise their prices. This can't prices. This can't go on, and yet it has. And I think one of the reasons why it has is because students have a blank check. Colleges can set the price wherever they want, and if students are want to go there, basically Congress gives them a blank check. And increasingly, again, students and their parents are taking on more and more debt in order to go to college. So, as long as there's that blank check out there, I think prices are going to continue to rise. And explain for us why debt from graduate school can be a particular concern. Right. So graduate school is really where you have a blank check. So students face a limit on how much they can borrow. Parents can pick up the slack. A lot of time parents aren't willing to do that, although more and more are. Grad school, if you're a grad student, again, you can borrow whatever the school charges. And one of the things that schools are doing right now is they are trying to get more students to enroll, particularly after this pandemic. So they're coming up with new programs, grad programs, to get students to enroll. A lot of times these programs pay off, but they don't always. And so this is where you, you end up with a lot of times $100,000 in debt, $150,000. Students assume it's going to pay off, and then, and then they find out in some cases that it, it does not. And because of the way that these loan programs where colleges and universities get their tuition payments, whether or not the students are, are able to repay their loans, do you think that anything would change at all if the schools actually had more skin in the game when it came to student debt? Yes, I think that uh, schools have taken advantage of this uh, hopeless, of this, of this hopefulness among students. This uh, one professor called it a cruel optimism of students where they come in and they think college is the ticket to a really secure, high paying lifestyle. And schools have taken advantage of that. And I think the reason why they've been able to, um, my book shows, is because they don't have to put up their own money. When a student gives them a student loan check, their student loan money, the school keeps that regardless if the student actually repays those loans. And so I think what we're seeing right now, a consensus among both political parties, that if you want to fix some of these problems, they both parties seem to agree you have to have schools suffer consequences if, if students fail to repay their loans. And you suggest in your book that colleges and graduate programs often aren't worth the explosive cost. So uh, what should young people consider when deciding whether or not to, to take the plunge and take on all of this debt? Well, the one good thing that's happened in recent years is there is more data that the Education Department is putting out there to look at which programs do pay off and which programs don't. And so there is more information. Just do, do your research before you enter into these programs. 
and see whether the school you're going to, whether the program you're going to actually has good outcomes from the student's, student's perspective. Josh Mitchell, we thank you so much. The debt trap, how student loans became a national catastrophe, it comes out on August 3rd and is now available for pre-order. Great, thanks. And still ahead, the jewelry heist by Scooter. And it is almost back to school time, or time to at least start thinking about going back to school. What are the best deals? Stay with us. Now, when it matters most, the straightforward facts. ABC News is America's number one news. Good Morning America, number one in the morning, nine years running. World News Tonight with David Muir, number one in the evening with America's most watched newscast. 2020, the number one news magazine on Friday nights. The View, the number one daytime talk show. And ABC News Live, number one in streaming news. ABC News is America's number one news. Powerful stories of our time, anytime. Nightline. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. Admit it, these days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA 3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? How cute. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. This is what being live is Please all about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded this by people no squeezing into this bomb shelter. We're on an urgent delivery run. With Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Lift off. Okay. Streaming straight to you anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. Welcome back. We are tracking several international headlines at this hour. Two suspects are now in custody after robbing a luxury jewelry store in the heart of Paris. The armed robbers arriving on two-wheel scooters before taking off with millions worth of stolen goods. Paris prosecutors confirm they have recovered a substantial part of the jewels stolen in the heist. Australia announcing today that its largest city will remain closed. Sydney's approximately 5 million residents will remain in lockdown until at least August 28th. The news comes after the city reported an additional 177 new infections within 24 hours, which is the largest daily record since mid-June. Music artist Shakira is heading to trial in Spain over tax evasion charges. The superstar is just one of several celebrities under investigation at this time. Multiple officials involved with the case confirmed to ABC News that there's enough evidence to take the star to trial. She's been accused of allegedly using shell companies to defraud the Spanish government of nearly $18 million between 2011 and 2014. To the classroom now, the pandemic is causing trouble when it comes to back-to-school shopping supplies. Experts say that the high demand could make it hard to find the essential supplies this year. It's a story that we first saw in the Washington Post, and ABC's Deirdre Bolton has more. Back-to-school season is just around the corner. Pens, pencils, binders, and with more classrooms fully reopening, experts say in a year plagued with product shortages and supply chain problems, demand will be high 
especially the longer you wait. If you're a family out there wanting to get all the school supplies, but usually wait until maybe a week or two before school, that's when it's going to become a problem. And even with rising prices, according to the National Retail Federation's annual survey, consumers plan to spend record amounts for both school and college supplies. Families with children in elementary through high school plan to spend an average of $848.90 on school items, which is $59 more than last year. Total back to school spending is expected to reach a record $37.1 billion, up from $33.9 billion last year. As you get closer to the back to school season and that demand for product goes up, more than likely you will not be able to find what you need. What can consumers do? Experts say take advantage of sales happening now. If you are, like many of us, a last minute shopper, you could always look to the maybe second or third generation of product that is not on your list, but something similar. Also, you can look at the secondhand market as well. You may have to spend a little bit more on that product, but there's certainly lots of product out there that you can find. Deidre, thank you. And for more tips on how to get the most from your back-to-school shopping, we bring in Trey Bodge, smart shopping expert at TrueTrade.com. Welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me back. So some states are doing tax-free days or even tax-free weeks for back-to-school shopping, which can, of course, mean great savings. How can we all take advantage of that? Yeah, so the best thing to do, because it does differ from state to state, and some states participate and some don't, you can Google tax-free holiday in the name of your state to find out the details. For instance, there are certain categories that qualify and others that don't. Some have spending limits, but it is a great way to save if your state does participate. And you work with a company called Coupon Cabin as a spokesperson, and this year the company is having a major event with big discounts. Tell us more about that. Yeah, so it's their 18th birthday, and they're celebrating in huge fashion by offering triple cash back. And this applies to stores like Macy's, Kohl's, Bloomingdale's, Nike, Office Depot, all those places where you're going to be doing your back-to-school shopping anyway. So be sure to go to couponcabin.com and then click on the offers right through there to save a lot on your back-to-school shopping. And let's get to your tips on how to survive this shopping season. First, let's start with school supplies. Yeah, so there's so much going on. We have the list from the school, and then we have all those things that our kids need. And so we talked about a resource like Coupon Cabin, but don't ignore, say, that Val Pack that comes in the mail, the coupons in your newspaper. These are all valuable ways to save. And then I would also look at places like the Dollar Store, because it's a great resource for things like foam core and poster board and composition notebooks. I would skip the pens. I don't find them to be the, the best quality, but those paper products are good. And then if you're feeling overwhelmed, as a lot of us are, the bigger box stores have great resources like blog posts that will help guide you along the way, like Walmart, Target, Amazon. Take a look at those resource to, resources to keep you on track. And lastly, let's talk about shopping for school clothes. I don't know if many parents are like me, but we neglected to go back to school shopping for clothes last season because he was on Zoom. So as a result, his, his shirts are probably a little too short, too tight at this point. You have a teenage <laughs> daughter. Uh, what are some of the tips that, that you help, man, that help you to manage? I do. So I have a 15 year old daughter and first of all, she loves to shop for herself. And so I like to give her spending money or a gift card and send her on her way with her friends. They can go to the mall and, and buy their clothes. The other thing is that I would reserve some of your clothing budget and not spend all of it before school, because inevitably the kids are going to go back to school. They're going to see what trends are happening. And then they're going to be asking you for that pair of sneakers, that jacket. So if you hold off some of that budget, then you can spend it when your child asks for those specific items. And then the last thing I would say is just because you don't have school-age kids doesn't mean that back-to-school sales aren't great, right? So the sales are typically on apparel, footwear, office supplies. These are things that many of us need. So if you don't have school-age kids but you happen to need those things, take advantage of the great savings that you're going to see for back-to-school. Some good tips for us all. Trey Bodge, so appreciate the information and advice. Thanks so much. Thanks again. And finally tonight, we're headed to the gorgeous state of Utah, a summer destination with a little something for everyone. ABC's Ashin Singh takes a tour of some of the state's remarkable sites. Behold Utah's breathtaking beauty. 
filled with otherworldly rock formations. The landscape's so epic, locals say Mother Nature played favorites. And now, cooped up nature lovers flocking to the state's national parks. They call them the Mighty Five. Starting with Arches National Park, a red rock paradise. And right around the corner, Canyonlands. And the most photographed landmark, the Mesa Arch. Number three, Capitol Reef, a geologic masterpiece, a wrinkle on Earth, nearly 100 miles long, creating this natural beauty. Next up, Bryce Canyon, where the sunrise sets the red rock pillars aglow. And last, but definitely not least, Zion. It can feel like a religious experience for devotees of our national parks. So Chris, I understand we're actually looking at Zion National Park, but we're actually in the Greater Zion area. We're on a private ranch in the Greater Zion area, but that is Zion National Park. I joined Utah Adventure Center for a hike of a lifetime. Chris, this is the most nervous I've been out here. I mean, how far up are we? We are about a thousand feet off the deck. I'm having a lot of fun, but I'm scared right now. <laughs> Climbing a Via Ferrata, Italian for an iron path, meaning I was strapped up and hooked in. Scaling some of Utah's most magnificent canyons. There are, a, there are thousands of hidden gems that are just out there waiting for people to, to discover. Sometimes people crowd too much to a few areas, but they're, they're gems like this that are all over the place. In fact, there are over 40 state parks that will blow your mind. I can't even describe just how incredible it is to be able to paddleboard between these structures. Draw-dropping landscapes that feel like a playground of the gods. This is Goblin Valley State Park. Why the name? These sandstone structures called hoodoos are said to resemble goblins. And this is the perfect place to get lost in their maze. Whoa! And in Sand Mountain, I got down and dirty with ATV and Jeep adventure tours. You see that rainbow behind me? I feel like I'm in a dream right now. Where I explored some of the 17,000 acres of off-roading trails ending at the spot they call the top of the world. This is the best spot in Utah though, right here. Because not only to get a view of Utah to the north, to the south, we see Arizona, and to the west, the setting sun, Nevada. It is pretty cool. Ash and having way too much fun there. Thanks for taking us along for the ride. And thank you so much for watching. That's our show for tonight. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Have a great night. Now, when it matters most, the straightforward facts.